Welcome to the Emerging Minds podcast. Welcome everyone. My name is Jill Munro from Emerging Minds. This episode is the second in our series exploring the impacts of adversity on children and families. And we will be looking at practice that's helpful in supporting parents to support their children's social and emotional well-being and resilience. So we're joined today by Lisa Hoffman and Gabby Munro from Jarrah House in New South Wales. Welcome, Lisa and Gabby. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, everybody. Hello, Jill. It's always nice to start off by finding a little bit more about your roles. So perhaps if you could start, Lisa, and just tell us a little bit more about what you do there at Jarrah House. I've been here more than a decade now. And my background is in social work and I've been specialising in child protection and working in the context of drug and alcohol for quite some time now. And that's my role here at Jarrah House. So we are a specialised service for women and children. So it is emergence of drug and alcohol, mental health and child protection. We have children under the age of eight living here and in residence with their mum while they go through drug and alcohol rehabilitation. So my role here is to work closely with the mothers in a therapeutic sense. We use dialectical behavioural therapy here and I also work with the mother-child relationship and in particular working on building mum's emotional availability to her child and reducing child protection risk. Thanks, Lisa. And Gabby, maybe you could tell us a little about your role at Jarrah House. So I've worked in childcare for about 35 years and I've been at Jarrah House for a bit over 12 years and I'm employed here as a therapeutic childcare worker. So I work very closely with Lisa because most children that come to Jarrah House have involvement with child protection and most of the children that come here also have developmental or behavioural issues regarding their often quite difficult and traumatic past and childhood. So it takes a lot of therapeutic work with the child and the parent to help these children back to a better developmental level. And like Lisa said, we work very closely with the mothers on emotional availability and on improving their relationship with children. So these are families that you're working with that specifically are experiencing issues with substance use, but I imagine that's not the only type of adversity that's going on in their lives. And perhaps just quickly, if you could give us a snapshot of the sorts of things these children and parents are trying to cope with in their lives, maybe Lisa? So the majority of the children who do come to reside at Jarrah House have been involved in the child protection system as Garby's already said, uh, the majority of the children we work with have some kind of developmental delay. Commonly, it presents in speech delay at the beginning, but as part of our program, we do thorough developmental assessments. So we do find that quite a number of uh, issues in terms of gross and fine motor skill development can emerge. We have lots of children who come through on the spectrum with various challenges in terms of feeding as well, um, sleep and settling, and it does all tend to come back to trauma. So it's interesting that sometimes we see developmental delay in the beginning that can be overcome quite rapidly through the admission here at Jarrah House, and then in other cases it, it needs more intervention. Most of the families who come through our program have experienced domestic violence. All of them have experienced substance misuse, that's why they're here, and comorbid mental health is a big part of the work that we do here as well. Uh, And all of that, of course, has a big impact on mum's ability to safely parent the child and be able to be responsive to the child's cues and also to make sense of perhaps her own early childhood trauma and the lack of emotional available parenting she may have received. And in circle of security terms, we talk about that shark music. So we encounter a lot of mums who have a lot of shark music here, which can get in the way of them being able to see their child and their child's behaviour for what it is and be able to respond appropriately and warmly to it. When you talk about shark music, what can you um, unpack that a little bit for me? So it's not uncommon. I'm, I'm thinking of an example, and Gabby will probably know who I'm referring to without needing to use names. 
we had a mum who came through our program and she'd already had a daughter removed from her care and unfortunately she'd been involuntarily adopted. So there was quite a significant trauma and, and loss for this mum already. And then she had a son. And when she arrived to us, she had her son with her. He was quite young still. And he was showing quite a lot of aggressive behaviour, lots of challenging behaviour, lots of biting and hitting and really not showing mum a lot of delight or warmth. And in return, mum therefore had started to respond with lots of punitive kind of responses and not much delighting in and certainly not much warmth. And in fact, the way that she mentalised about her son was that he's a monster and he really does hate me. Uh, He'd been quite recently restored to her at the age of two after his first two years being in care. So mum was experiencing an awful lot of shark music rejection in terms of the loss of her older child and now feeling that this little toddler was also rejecting her. And so the work that we were able to do with her was really to transform her mentalising about her child. We used a tool called KIPS, which is the Keys to Interactive Parenting Scale, and we were able to capture on video while she was just playing as she normally would with her son, moments of warmth and connection, moments where he was looking at her with delight. And we were able to play that back for her and from a strength-based perspective start to build her warmth and her empathy for him to understand that what really was happening was that this was a little toddler who was quite confused and and quite traumatised by the sudden separation from the carers he'd known for the first two years and that it was going to take time and patience to build his connection with mum and his capacity to be able to show his cues and for her to understand them. And she started to see his aggressive behaviour more as a cry for help rather than a rejection. And so slowly over time we saw through the admission here her being able to start to read his cues or rather his miscues. So when he'd respond to her in an aggressive manner, she would show him warmth and love and care and slowly he softened to her, she softened to him. And by the end of the admission, um, there was a day where he was unwell. He had quite a high fever and for the first time he turned to her and wanted a cuddle, wanted connection, wanted warmth. And it was quite a moment where we could see that transformation. So I guess her shark music really was that she'd had her own experiences of domestic violence. She'd had her own experiences of being rejected in childhood, not shown warmth, not shown much nurturance. And then she'd lost an older child into care. So she was experiencing all of that quite normal behaviour from her toddler who was really crying out for connection and attachment as rejection. So being able to actually understand that as sharp music and start to mentalise about it differently allowed their relationship to flourish. So, yeah, Gabby, I'm just really interested in um, how this plays out in the childcare centre. I mean, what you would witness between that mother and the little two-year-old. Um, if you can talk us through that a bit, just give us a visual of your work with the, the child and mum. So I'm really interested in seeing the arrival process of mothers and their children at Jarrah House um, because I can tell pretty quickly from the initial interaction with the mother and the child and observing the two of them together what their relationship is like. So we might have a child, like the child Lisa was talking about, coming into Jarrah House, looking around, seeing some toys and immediately running towards the childcare centre, not looking back, not waiting for his mother, having no anxiety around leaving her side and just wanting to come and play. Mm -hmm. Or we can have a child come in that shows the opposite, very, very clingy, hanging off the mum, not um, wanting to make eye contact with someone, which is initially obviously normal because they're in a very new environment with a lot of people they haven't met. But if this continues, and sometimes it does for days, if not weeks, that's, again, another relationship. So with the little boy that Lisa was describing and he was having lots of very big feelings, lots of aggression. He'd obviously just been reunited with his mother and hadn't had a chance to build up, you know, this emotional relationship with her. So he felt very lost. He had really no one he could rely on. So he needed a lot of guidance and a lot of warmth and a lot of inclusion from both childcare and his mother to sort of find a place where he started feeling safe and could settle down a bit. We also have children that are hypervigilant. 
So we have a child, for example, who's a little bit older, who will not leave his mother's side. Because in a way, even though he's still very young, he feels he's responsible to keep an eye on his mother and watch over her. So this child has really high levels of anxiety, particularly when he doesn't know where his mother is. But the anxiety transfers then to other parts of his life as well. So he lacks a lot of confidence and self-esteem, which makes relationships for him, social relationships at school, very difficult. Yeah. So we treat the children here as clients as well. So mum comes in and she's a client of our service, but so is the child. So I'm just thinking of the little boy that Gab is referring to, and he's six, so he is of school age. And part of the work we've needed to do with him is to give him a voice so that he can start to express his feelings and make sense of the adverse experiences that he has had which have included quite significant domestic violence and also witnessing his mother's suicide attempt. He needed to to call for an ambulance and watch her be revived after an overdose. So he's experienced quite significant adversity and naturally is incredibly hypervigilant and concerned for his mother. He, he's quite preoccupied with his anxiety around her well-being. And so some of the work with him has been to give him a voice and he has started to open up to the childcare staff without his mother being present about some of his experiences and be able to be supported by another loving adult caregiver figure who is not his mother. And I think that that's a really important part of what childcare on site offer here. And it's why we refer to them as therapeutic childcare workers because it goes beyond providing them with social and educational and learning opportunities. And it really does become a holding environment for their emotional well-being, their psychological well-being. And they often start to open up and make sense of their experiences in a way that then allows for referral to more ongoing therapeutic intervention. Yeah. And I guess it's so important then for you to be able to support the child and mother so that the mother has an understanding and the child is able to communicate with the mother around those same stories. How does that start to come about? Well, I use a lot of reflective parenting practice. So when a child is having a temper tantrum, for example, and the mother is maybe inclined to tell the child to stop screaming, I will say, I wonder what your child is going through right now. I wonder what your child is feeling. What sort of emotion do you think he's showing us? And let her think about it. She might initially just say, oh, you know, he's just having a tantrum. And I'm saying, and what emotion do you think he's expressing with a tantrum? I should say anger. So I will often try and say, well, if you're angry, what helps you calm down? Do you like it when people send you away or do you like it when people stay close and offer you support? And she said, no, I need support in order to calm down. And I said, how about if we try that approach with your child? Maybe if you offered support instead of punitive action, see what happens. And I let the mother do and practice. And often we get quite amazing results. So I use a lot of seeing and guessing. So I say to the parent, well, what do you see and what do you think your child is going through right now? What do you think this feels like for your child? What does it feel like for you? So that is the one approach I take and I also do a lot of role modeling. So I will walk up to a child like that and I will say, oh, I think you're having very big feelings right now. I think you're very angry because, you know, someone else took your toy away. I can see that you're really upset about that. So I will, I will actually role model how I validate feelings and how I validate emotions and encourage the mother to sort of try something similar and see what the result of it is. I'm thinking of another example, and, and Gabby often refers to it in our parenting group, of a mother who rushed into the childcare and she hadn't seen her, her little one for the morning because she'd been in program. And the little one was really enthusiastically colouring in and drawing and just very involved in an art activity. And mum's need in that moment was for some acknowledgement, some validation that she'd been missed. But the child was on the top of the circle. She wasn't on the bottom of the circle ready to give mum a hug and and warmth. She was really quite busy on the top of the circle exploring and, and making art. So there was that misattunement between where the child was on the circle of exploration and where mum was on the bottom of the circle wanting some warmth and validation and reconnection. And mum missed that cue and really interpreted that as a rejection and it escalated quite quickly and ended with, you know, the child being dragged out of childcare 
tantruming and crying and, you know, feeling quite hard done by that she hadn't been able to finish her artwork. And it was when Gabi was actually able to give that feedback to mum about where the child was on the circle and how she might have been able to make a connection by joining her, enjoying with her in her play rather than trying to drag her to the bottom of the circle for a hug in that particular moment. And that was quite transforming because mum was then able to start interpreting that behaviour as what it was, which was just that her child was on the top of the circle and she learned to be able to try and make connection first and join her wherever she was, usually on top of the circle in play, in order to then actually have the child join her in the bottom of the circle for that reconnection and that warmth that mum was craving. Yeah. And Gabby, it's really interesting to hear you talking as well from the child's perspective. And I'd just like to hear a little bit more around the communication of the child to the mother. Because children often take the blame, don't they, for these sorts of things. They feel that it's something that they've done especially if they're not allowed to communicate or they don't, you know, nobody can help them communicate these their feelings around that. How did that happen in your setting? So one thing that's really important for us is to build a feeling of safety and security for the children. So we have our routines at childcare and what we use is with the social security approach, we use a lot of validating feelings. So we don't dismiss a child's concerns or feelings. So when the six-year-old had been with us for a few weeks and he started to feel very comfortable with the child care workers, we had an interaction where we were sitting at the table and we were playing with Play-Doh and he brought up worries in a conversation and I asked him, I said, oh, do you have worries? And he said, yes, I have some bad thoughts. And I said, oh, do you? And he said, yeah, I'm really scared that my mum will die. So he was at that stage it, disclosing to me what his big fear is. And so I, with, I don't jump in and try and fix things, but I actually validate how difficult that experience must be for him. He had had counselling previously about this incident where his mother overdosed in front of him and I asked him whether his previous experience of attending counselling was helpful to him and he said, yes, that was really good to talk about it. And I said, would you like to go and do that again? And he said, yes, I would. So I was then able to approach the case manager and say the child has expressed to me that he would like to go back to counselling and she then had a conversation with the mother and we can then take steps to get that happening again for this child. You have talked so beautifully and well around your work and I'm just trying to think of questions that will enable people that work in more generalist settings to pick up on some of these skills that you have and maybe try stuff out in a setting where they don't have the child and mother on site living with them. So I'm just thinking particularly around things like parents being triggered by child's behaviour and if you can talk a little bit more around that. Our perspective here at Jarrah House, because we use dialectical behavioural therapy, it does actually assist us to work with what we refer to as shark music or in more general terms, you know, early trauma experiences that can shape how a parent interprets their child's behaviour. So in the sense of dialectical behavioural therapy, the connection between DBT and our parenting program or our parenting intervention is that we are already working with the mothers in terms of their emotion regulation skills and their ability to use distress tolerance skills. So in the sense of when they are then triggered, because of their access to DBT, they're already practising mindfulness, which hopefully will help them to catch when they're being triggered and to notice what it's bringing up for them, both in terms of body sensations but also in terms of thinking and also in terms of their behavioural responses. So the hope is to build that level of mindful awareness so that rather than reacting to their child's behaviour, they're able to respond. So rather than yelling and punitive responses, they start to be able to do what they need to do to take care of themselves in those moments, give themselves a little bit of a time out, practice some distress tolerance skills, practice some emotion regulation so that they can then parent from a place of a calmer space, not obviously completely calm, Parenting can be triggering and and challenging for anybody. So 
the mothers we're working with who already have some additional vulnerabilities naturally, they're going to find parenting stressful at times. But at least to be able to respond in a calmer and more regulated way starts to build their own sense of self-worth, their sense of self-worth not only as a mother but as a, as a woman. I think it's very important for a parent to see the child through a child lens because that is often lacking in our women. And I mean, referring to your question, because obviously not everybody has the children and the mothers in a residential facility for several weeks. I think some psychoeducation is really important around brain development of the child and a two-year-old is built to have temper tensions between the age of two and three, that this is developmental normal, that it's not naughty or terrible or something awful that we need to stop and to explain why it's happening and then rephrase the behaviour for the parent and say, what do you think your child's expressing right now? Are you feeling really triggered by this? What is it that triggers you in this behaviour? What do you think is actually happening for the child? What is your feelings in this and what's your child's actual need. And this is quite possible in everyday situations. So even in a walk to the playground, we can use this. We can use it when the women go to the shops and the children are starting to have a little tantrum in the supermarket. We can use this style of seeing and guessing and trying to see the child through the child's lens and not the mother's lens, which is sort of clouded by her own past trauma and childhood experiences, which is what we call the shark music. You know, it's just lovely to have the benefit of both of your wisdom and experience in working with these mothers and their children. Um, and I think there's a lot that people can get from the way that you're describing this that can be translated into a more generalist setting, really. I'm just wondering that something that I always think is a reasonably easy place to start, shall we say, is the establishment of routines between parent and child. We know that children feel it really adds to their sense of stability and security if there's a few routines and structures and so on. How do you go about that at Jarrah House? So a lot of mothers come in here and we sit down with them and we have a little questionnaire and we ask them about their routines at home. And obviously they come often from very adverse circumstances and there has been very little routine. So mother will say there's no firm bedtimes, there's no firm meal times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jara itself, our program, has quite firm routines for the women as well as for the children. And the children then sort of have to slot into the system. So by eight o'clock, all children have to be in bed, for example. And we help the mothers. We can sit down with them. We can actually make up a little schedule about what time does your child wake up? What do you do first? You get them dressed. Then you have to give them breakfast. So we can help with that. We can visualize that. We can do a visual chart or we can write it down. With older children, we could encourage that, oh, I've brushed my teeth. I put a little star on it. I've done that. You know, I do a little tick. And a lot of mothers will say how suddenly having a routine has helped them enormously bringing some calm into their relationship with their children because they suddenly realise that they don't have to constantly argue about what's happening after dinner. Are we having dinner at 8? Are we having dinner at 10? Are we going to bed straight after dinner? Once the child gets used to, you know, having dinner, having a bath, brushing your teeth, then having a story read, and then it's bedtime, the daily struggle stops. The child gets used to it that is what we're doing now, and suddenly they don't need to constantly push limits and boundaries. So it is often a huge eye-opener, and many women walk out of here saying, I will definitely keep to the routine that I've acquired at Jera House. It's helped us so much having a calmer environment and less stressful situations where the child needs to constantly push limits and boundaries about bedtimes, mealtimes, etc., I find that it's not uncommon when children have been in situations of domestic violence that mums have had to use routines that have potentially kept the child safe. So things like using dummies or bottles for longer than you know necessarily ideal, just as a as a means of keeping little ones quiet. You know, toileting perhaps with women who've come from homelessness, it's been easier just to keep the little one in nappies beyond the, the usual developmental age just simply for lack of access to clean facilities and opportunities for regular hygiene. So 
we also find that sometimes women rely on the support that they have available while they're here at Jarrah House to be able to implement those big changes that they've been wanting to make, but perhaps just haven't had the right circumstances and supports to implement. So we often see mums when they arrive, little ones are still using dummies, still wearing nappies, perhaps clinging to bottles well beyond the age where perhaps it would be ideal. And we see those routines change as well with the right supports and in the right environment. I have the experience often when I run the parenting group, when I talk about routines and rituals with children, I compare that to the women in our facility. We have a program that is pretty structured, like we have a group at 9, we have a group at 11, we have a group at 1.30. Of course, the topic changes, but that's sort of the routine of when things happen. And if for some reason might be staffing issues, might be meetings that have to take place, this routine is thrown out, the women become incredibly unsettled. So I make that connection. I say, imagine if we came in here in the morning and said, oh, look, today, you know, we're not quite sure yet when we're going to have a house meeting and we might run a group, but we might not. And maybe today we'll do the walk in the mornings instead of the afternoons. How would you feel about it? And they said, that would be terrible. That would be so unsettling. It feels so not safe. And they can suddenly make the connection that their children would probably feel quite similarly to this if there's no routines in the home. So that works quite well as a comparison for them. Yeah, lovely, Gabby. Nice visual. It really is, isn't it? It sort of makes it so clear. And I mean, it's funny because routines can seem to be something so restricting, but in actual fact, the way you're describing it. Ride safety and predictability, which when you've been through trauma is really what you need, children and adults. Yeah. Another thing I was interested in is um, support. So I imagine that a lot of the women that come to you, well, you've described that they come from backgrounds of family and domestic violence and intergenerational hardship and so on. So can you talk to us a little around building those supports for women? So we've been implementing the Parents Under Pressure program, and that's known as PUP around here for quite a few years now and we originally trained under Dr Sharon Dore at Griffith University and implemented that program here back in about 2017. So PUP uses an integrative framework that acknowledges the importance of community and family supports to build mum's capacity to be able to be emotionally available to her child. So that's the lens through which we look when we're discharge planning here and building support networks for mum and child to have available to them when they leave our program. So for some families that's going on to another longer-term program, for other families that's going home to the community. And either way, building those supports, whether that's professional supports, community-based supports or kinship supports, is really important because we know that the antidote to addiction is connection. So it's often that isolation and that lack of support that's actually led to an escalation in the substance use and and the mental health issues that mum presents with when she enters our program. So particularly we would be looking at things like rekindling healthy kinship connections. So often through the periods of addiction, the women report that they have fallen out with family members or family members have withdrawn support perhaps because they just felt they didn't know what else to do. So we quite commonly under our family inclusive practice policy here incorporate family members wherever possible where those connections are healthy and supportive. Obviously sometimes there can be barriers to accessing kinship support in a generational patterns of addiction and mental health for example and trauma. But where possible, we we try and invite family members in. We make referrals to family drug support so that families have the right supports to be the right support for the women who are exiting treatment. We make referrals to professional support services where needed, and that's part of our discharge planning. And it can be as simple as we've got quite a few women who've gone through our program, and it's about a referral to a sporting for them and their child to go and join a local soccer club or a local touch football club. So it's about rebuilding that sense of connection to their local community through a healthy activity or hobby that's going to be able to also be an opportunity to build relationship between parent and child through a common passion or interest. 
And Gabby, what about for the child? Because often the children will be completely unconnected. Is this something that you work with in childcare with the mothers as well? So I would feed back a lot of information I get about the child to both the mother and the caseworker who's in charge of the discharge planning. So um, we had a little boy here who was also quite isolated because he had to, with together with his mother, flee his um, his home environment because um, the perpetrator was at large, the perpetrator of the domestic violence. They had to move to a completely new area where they had no connections at that stage. And he was incredibly passionate about rugby. So we actually managed, while he was here, to book him into a rugby club near his home. So we supported his mother in doing that. And uh, he is still playing. And this is where he forms new connections now. So he forms connections to same-age children, but it gives his mother an opportunity when she goes with him to the training sessions and the games to also link up with other parents. And another lens of that would be we have a lot of Aboriginal children in our care, and some of them obviously due to the intergenerational trauma the family has experienced have often not had a lot of opportunity to be in touch with our own culture. So we had one girl who was very passionate about dancing and we facilitated that her mother booked her into Aboriginal dance classes in their local area. So when they left here, the girl was then able to join this dance class. And it's not just about going dancing and doing, you know, the cultural activity, but about liaising then and socialising with same-age children and for the mother to meet other parents at the same time, which gets them out of the home and out into the community. So I will work with the caseworker and the mother on this together. Great. Thank you so much. It's just really fascinating to hear you both speaking. And we've really just about reached the end of our podcast, although I could just keep listening to you both. But um, if there's anything we've missed, anything that you would like to add, perhaps you first, Lisa, thoughts, dilemmas or strategies that we may have not managed to cover? No, look, I think we've we've covered a lot today. I, I guess for us here at Jarrah House, it really is about being very lucky to have the opportunity to have the children on site. And I'm very aware that some listening to this podcast may not have that same opportunity. So it's just to re-emphasise again that even if the child is not present in the service where you're having interactions with the mother or the parent, it is really possible to engage the parent in conversations about how they're thinking and feeling about their child's behaviour. And that can tell you an awful lot in terms of what might need to be worked on and what might be going well and what might need some encouragement uh, in terms of how the parent is responding to the child's behaviour. So it leads to some very interesting conversations and how two different parents can interpret the same sorts of behaviour from their child and it really is influenced by their own history, their, how they were parented and, and whether they've had exposure to adverse experiences. So. I think that would be something I'd really emphasise. It's possible to get a lot of information by engaging parents in those conversations. Yeah, great. Really useful. Thank you. It's actually, I'm glad Lisa mentioned that because that is also, not all the women at Jar House have their children here with them. Some might be staying with grandparents, some might be in foster care, and we can actually help a lot with improving the relationship with those children as well through the skills we described, the seeing and guessing, the how do I talk to my child on the phone? Oh, I could write my child a letter to keep in touch. We had someone ask a question the other day, my daughter doesn't really want to talk when she's on the phone. She's a five-year-old. She's come home from school. It's mum's phone time. And she says, what did you do at school? And the child says nothing. And then we could suggest to the mother that she would just talk about her own day, the things that maybe would interest the child, that you went to for a walk today and you went down to the beach and you found some beautiful shells. And again, this is sort of trying to explain to the mother why the child might not be wanting to talk at four o'clock after going to school, but also what can I do to still engage my child and not feel that we had a 30-second conversation and then we both hang up. So we can do a lot of work for the women that don't have their children with them here as well. And there's some wonderful resources available on the Emerging Minds website in terms of the package that was released last year, just building relationship with children who aren't in the parents' care 
through various circumstances. So we draw on those resources. We've got those posters up around our facility here at Jarrow House and we quite often get parents, uh, mothers coming and asking us for ideas of how they can connect with their child while they're not in their care. Thanks for the plug there, Lisa. And I'll just reiterate for people that was the Keeping in Touch resources. Many, many parents out there who don't take their children into therapy with them, but there's always some strategies that those counsellors can use to actually do something towards building that parent-child relationship in those circumstances. And the work of Arietta Slade, you know, around keeping the child in mind, that it is so important to value what practitioners are offering to children, even if they never actually meet the child, just in supporting the mother or just in supporting the parent. Because the more that they can be supported to find their own well-being, the more that they're going to be capable of being reflective and offering attunement to their child. So there's there's so much value to what practitioners are offering when they're sitting in a room and supporting a mother or a parent, even if they never meet the child. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa and Gabby. It was really interesting to hear from both of you. And I'd love to get you back one day, actually, but uh, we'll have to leave it there just now. But thank you so much again, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Jill. You're very welcome. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au to access a range of resources to assist your practice. Brought to you by the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, led by Emerging Minds. The National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Programme.